welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you had a little bit of coffee with your lunch because I've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, and thank you to Lindsay for inviting me to talk to uh, the seniors and other people that might be interested in antique apples and grafting apple trees. It's a hobby of mine that I've had for about, I don't know, six, eight years now. And uh, I've got a couple hundred antique apple trees and I, I love talking about them. I find the apples both common and fascinating. I mean, you can find them at, at any supermarket and McDonald's and markets all around the world. And yet um, they have a long history. You know, apples um, started evolving uh, millions of years ago and they were spread from the Kazakhstan region um, across the continent and you know along the Silk Road. Uh, apple seeds have been found in archaeological sites going back 10,000 years and people have been grafting apple trees for at least 4,000 years and if you think about that that's that's really kind of amazing um, that such an advanced technique uh, was available 4,000 years ago. And most people don't realize that there were many, many apple varieties that have now been lost. In the year 1900, there were 17,000 named North American apple varieties. Every farmer was trying to find uh, the next red delicious apple. And um, it's just amazing to me that so many of those apples have been lost. But fortunately, there are hobbyists like myself that um, try to uh, keep them going. And um, there are even people that hike out into the woods and try to find old apple trees and rediscover lost varieties. Apples, unfortunately, were heavily selected for their looks and keeping ability, which is why we ended up with an apple that looks great but doesn't taste so great, which is the Red Delicious. Um, other characteristics like flavor um, sort of lost out in the selection process. But uh, there's sort of a resurgence of interest in antique apples. Uh, some people call them heirloom apples. And um, at the end of the talk, I'll tell you where you can go to taste some of them. So um, this is the boring part. I need to give you some definitions at first. Graft can be used both as a verb and a noun. When it's used as a graft, it means to take parts of two different trees and put them together to make one tree. And the place where those two trees join together is also um, a graft in the noun sense of the word. Rootstock is the bottom part of that grafted tree. So it would be the roots and some of the trunk. And the rootstock dictates a lot of the final features of the plant, such as the size that it grows to. If you've ever bought a dwarfed, uh, a dwarf tree, the reason it's dwarfed is because the scion or top part of the plant was grafted onto a rootstock that um, yields a small tree. The vigor of the plant, how fast it grows, how soon it fruits. Um, and disease resistance are all dictated by the rootstock. The scion, the top part of the plant, that um, dictates the color and shape of the leaf, the color and flower, the time that it flowers, and the characteristics of the fruit. So those are the two essential parts that you need to understand for um, grafting. Um, as, as I mentioned, apples uh, have an interesting history that's uh, being discovered by archaeologists. It's believed that apples first evolved in the Kazakhstan region in Asia. And um, one unique feature of the Kazakhstan region is that there are east to west mountain ranges so that the glaciers did not come through Kazakhstan and, and wipe clean uh, the landscape as they did in Europe and North America. So uh, the apples were able to evolve there. Our modern apple, Malus domestica, is felt to be um, a hybrid between the wild apple of Kazakhstan, which is seen here, Malus siversii um, from Kazakhstan, and Malus sylvestris from Europe. And there's probably contribution from at least um, two other apples um, species. There's somewhere between 30 and 45 apple species in the world including some that are native to North America, like crab apples. Uh, 
this is a slide just to introduce the topic of apple genetics. So I want to talk a little bit about apple genes. You can see these apples aren't even that different from each other. These are all sort of modern apples, and there's some differences in color and shape. Um, but when you get to some antique apples, you're going to see some real different characteristics like russeting of the skin, which is uh, like a sandpapery look that's more like a pear, and uh, knobs and smaller shapes. Uh, I have a rule of thumb when I'm tasting an apple. Usually if an apple looks bad, it's going to taste good because who would grow an ugly apple that tasted bad? So um, it's a good rule of thumb. The uglier the apple, it's, the better it's going to taste. So let's compare these three apples, Gala, Braeburn, and Jazz. Who would have thought that Jazz was the offspring of Gala and Braeburn? But it is. Um, so apples, unlike people, have both male and female parts. Uh, they took the pollen from one tree and uh, put it onto the uh, receptacle of the other tree, and the seed yielded a jazz. But um, it didn't just take one crossing to get this new apple jazz. Most of the time when you take pollen from one uh, apple tree and put it on a second tree, you get an apple that really uh, is inferior to the parents because apples have much more heterogeneity in their genes. So the jazz apple, which was developed in New Zealand, it was the result of multiple cross-pollinations. In other words, they, they planted 8,500 seeds and grew them long enough to fruit and then picked one out of the 8,500 trees that was felt to be superior to the two parents. And, uh, and you know, this is the sort of work that um, agricultural scientists have to do in order to uh, create a new apple like Honeycrisp. So why are apples um, so much more heterogeneous than humans? Well, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we have 46 chromosomes. And you can't tell from looking at this uh, group of human chromosomes which ones came from the mother, which ones came from the father. One came from each, except for the sex chromosomes where X came from the mother and Y came from the father. Um, so you get two copies of every gene, one from your mother, one from your father. Apples have four copies, and the reason for that is they have 17 pairs of chromosomes, but at one point in their history, apples had only nine pairs of chromosomes, and um, there was a doubling event, and a chromosome was lost, and as a result, apples have uh, four copies of every gene instead of just two copies like humans. And so if you have an apple and you take the five seeds out of an apple and plant them, you'll get five different trees and they will all be markedly different from each other. Um, the other reason that apples are very heterogeneous is they're self-sterile. Unlike a peach, you can't take the pollen from a flower on one part of the tree and put it on a flower on a different part of the tree and get a fertile seed. With a peach, you can do that and you can plant the seed and it can be very much like the parent peach. But apples, if you were to take red delicious pollen and dust it onto a red delicious apple uh, flower, you won't get a viable seed from that. They're self-sterile. So basically, um, it's a way of enforcing heterogeneity. And so what the end result is, if you want um, to grow, for instance, uh, Granny Smith apples, you have to find somebody who has a Granny Smith apple tree and take a branch from that and propagate it clonally. And there's two ways you could do that. You could take the branch and stick it in the ground or stick it in potting soil with, with um, rooting hormone. And if you're lucky, you'll get roots on that and then it'll grow but the characteristics of that tree will maybe not be ideal for you. The roots might be weak or something. So that's why people graft trees. They want to have uh, the proper kind of fruit and the proper kind of roots. So um, as I mentioned, this is why we graft. Apples don't grow true from seeds. Many apples are self-sterile. Every commercial apple is a clone of its parent. So when you buy a Granny Smith apple, that apple came from a tree uh, that was grafted from a tree that came from a tree that came from a tree all the way back to Mrs. Smith's 
apple tree in Australia. The other thing about um, grafting is that it allows you to rapidly um, propagate trees. If you take a five-year-old rootstock and you put a, a scion onto it, you have a tree that's got a two or three year head start on one that you grew from seed or if you uh, rooted the, the scion. So here's a picture of what some graphs look like. These are not the sort of graphs that I do. I do one called a whip and tongue graft, but these are mature trees, which, um, you know, it, this could have been a Macintosh and the farmer decided he wasn't selling enough Macintosh apples and he wanted to go with an heirloom variety. So he got some uh, Ashmead's kernel or something like that and um, cut the tree in such a way that he could insert the scion and line up the cambium layers and get them to join together. So what do you need for supplies? First, you need a sharp knife. That's the single most important thing a sharpening stone to keep that knife short, sharp, some freezer tape, which is um, a lot like masking tape. You can buy it at the hardware store. It looks just like masking tape, but it's, it's a little bit stickier and it'll stick to a package in your freezer even though it's slightly damp and frozen. Grafting wax, which I'll show you an example of. And of course, it's always helpful to have some band-aids because you're working with a sharp knife and you're gonna need them. So let's look at some old apple varieties. Uh, these are some of my favorites. This one is called Ashmead's Kernel and it was discovered in Gloucester, England in about the year 1700. You can see it's kind of a russeted apple. Uh, russeting is that sort of paper, sandpaper type of look that you see on some pears like I think Bosque pears have a lot of russeting, and um, a lot of old apples have this. It was considered sort of an undesirable feature for marketing apples because, you know, who doesn't like the look of a nice bright red apple? But a lot of times a, a russeted apple will have great taste. And uh, Ashmead's kernel is one of my favorites. It's both sweet and tart and has lots of flavor. Uh, makes a, a great cider also. This apple um, is one that was discovered in Westfield, uh, not far from here. And this apple uh, goes back to the 1700s and it was one of the three most popular apples in colonial times. And it's pretty hard to find, but I recently did uh, find and taste one of these apples. And uh, this year I'm grafting some of the trees. Newtown Pippin is another favorite of mine. This one comes in both yellow and green varieties. Newtown um, was at one time the name of Queens, New York, or a part of um, Long Island, which is now Queens. And uh, this apple was discovered in Queens in the mid 1700s. And it was popular with both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And Ben Franklin is reported to have brought a couple barrels of these over to Europe as a gift for the queen. This is a Sopus Spitzenberg. I don't know if anybody's ever been up in the uh, Catskills near a Sopus, but this apple originated in a Sopus. And a uh, great place to fly fish, by the way, is Sopus River. Um, the Sopus Spitzenberg was Thomas Jefferson's favorite apple, and it's quite well known for that. Also a good eating apple. Grimes Golden. Uh, this is a more recent apple, 1804, West Virginia. It's a parent of the Golden Delicious, and I think you can see the similarity. Uh, this one happened to be my wife's aunt's favorite apple, and that's one that I'm grafting this year. Now, where can you go to get and taste some of these apples? I'm not being paid for this, but um, a, a very uh, fun place to go visit is Scott Farm Orchard in Dummerston, Vermont. They have 130 varieties of old apples, and uh, they, it's not a pick your own uh, kind of place, but they do have a farm stand. Uh, and anytime you go there between August and October, they'll have between 20 and 30 different kinds of apples that are uh, freshly picked. And you can um, take uh, you know, one from each container, make sure you write down what it is, take it home and taste it. And uh, you'll be amazed at the flavors that you'll find there. 
uh, this is a good uh, source for um, Apple information. It's called orangepippin.com and they have a lot of information about old Apple varieties and I found it to be very reliable. So let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of grafting. This is my last slide and then um, I'll show you some materials and how to graft. Uh, so this is the graft that I normally do and it's a useful graft when you have a scion and a rootstock which are similar in diameter. Uh, the basic idea is you want a scion that has at least two buds, sometimes three uh, buds, and the rootstock doesn't need any buds, but you want to have enough of um, the rootstock so that you have a, a reasonable trunk after the tree matures. And basically what you're doing is slicing the scion at an angle, matching that same angle on the rootstock, then putting a notch in both parts, and sliding them together in such a way that the notch lines up with the tab. And uh, the key, very important thing is that you want the cambium layer to line up. So if the bark is a little thicker on one than the other, uh, the cambium layer is the one you want to match. The cambium layer is the layer that's right under the bark. So that was my last slide. I'm going to stop the screen sharing and turn off my screensaver so that you can see better what I've got here. So I said I would show you a grafting knife. This is my grafting knife and it's very sharp. It's only sharpened on one side, not both sides of the blade. And there's a tab up at the top here which you can use to raise the bark if you need to. Um, this is the grafting wax. I first saw grafting wax in my father's basement back in the 1960s. I don't know if it was his or if it was the previous house owner, but it got me interested in what it was used for. And this is what it looks like. I keep it in a cat food can and I put it on the barbecue in a little frying pan with some water while I'm grafting. And um, that melts and you can apply it to the freezer tape to prevent drying out. Uh, let's see, so I've got some rootstock here. So this is a uh, just a pot with some potting soil and a dozen pieces of, um, this is a Russian rootstock, it's called Bud 9. Bud is short for something I can't pronounce, I'm sure. Um, but you can see that it's already uh, pushing out leaves. These are pieces of my rootstock, which I cut off when I was grafting this year, and I just shoved them in the potting soil. The great thing about uh, rootstock is it just wants to live. So even though these didn't have any roots when I cut them off, I uh, put them in the soil and it's already uh, growing leaves and I expect it will grow some roots. Now this is an old apple variety called Spokane Beauty, which um, I had extra scions. I didn't have a place to graft them. So I just stuck them in a pot with soil and it looks like they're alive. So these apples will grow, I think, on their own roots. We'll see. I don't just graft apples. This is a uh, pear tree that I had, which the deer ate the top of the tree, and so it started pushing up um, shoots from the roots, and I knew that they wouldn't be edible pears, but I can now use this um, as the rootstock for additional pear trees. I'm also interested in American chestnuts, and I just have to show you this. This is an American chestnut which grew from a chestnut from Massachusetts. Uh, most people heard about the chestnut blight and thought there are no chestnut trees left, but a small percentage of chestnut trees still um, survive as roots and push up shoots. And at some, if you're lucky, uh, some of them will flower and have fruit and um, by fruit, I mean nuts. And uh, then you can grow American chestnuts. They're not gonna be resistant to the blight, uh, but the American Chestnut Foundation is working to get a blight 
resistant uh, chestnut tree. So this is a tree that I grafted earlier and I have I think eight of these that are gonna be available if, if people make a donation to the Friends of Long Meadow Seniors. Um, I think Lindsay said a, a $10 donation would get you one of these trees. And this one is an Asopa Spitzenberg, but I also have some Westfield Seek No Further, a Grimes Golden, and some Ashmead's Kernel. And I don't know if it's in focus really, but the the tape here is where the graft is. And below the tape, there's a little leaf growing here from the rootstock. And then above the tape, there are two buds which have opened. And that's a little bit out of focus. I guess if I bring it back, maybe it'll focus better. Uh, anyways, it's got some leaves growing on it. So let me show you the technique and then we'll have some questions. It looks like I've spent about 20 minutes talking, which is about what I was hoping for. So here's a scion. And the way to do the graft is with one slice to make a sloping cut. So let's consider that to be the root stock. Make a notch. And then on the scion, Make a matching notch. And then by exerting pressure, just so, and lining them up, you can slide them together. And you can see it makes a stable, relatively stable graft, long enough to tape it up and then cover it with wax. So that's the peak of grafting. And uh, now, Lindsay, if you can figure out how to unmute people or use the chat window, we can answer some questions. Okay, I know that Brett has a question. I'll unmute him first. Okay. Welcome, Brett. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, just how long before that graph that we just saw would be yielding fruit? Um, I have some trees that fruited well last year, and I think it's been about four years since I grafted them. A lot depends on the uh, rootstock that you use. The more dwarfing the rootstock, the faster it'll fruit. So um, a standard apple tree, which is you know going to be a 50-foot tree, could take eight to 10 years to fruit, but a super dwarf, which is more like a tomato plant, uh, can fruit in a couple years. Great, thank you. Celeste, I can hear you, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering who or what group of people or from what part of the world did people first learn to graft? That's a good question and that's unfortunately lost in, um, prehistory. Um, it's known that grafting originated in the Tigris-Euphrates area about 4,000 years ago. So it's... Wow. Yeah, it's before recorded history. That's and and apple seeds have been found at archaeological archaeologic sites going back 10,000 years. But, um, you know, those were probably wild collected apples rather than grafted apples. Okay, so do I understand this correctly that apples will not grow from an apple seed? You'll get a you'll get a tree, but it could be a crab apple or something you wouldn't want to eat. Yeah, the um, the genome of the apple is very heterogeneous. There's four copies of every gene. And so, you know, just like people don't have clones for children, um, Apples are even more extreme because they have four copies of every gene, not just two copies. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, Sharon has a question. How do we prepare the ground if planting one of the trees we buy from you? What time of year? And are there online directions you would recommend? Um, 
I, um, I can generate some, some directions. My advice would be to grow it like a house plant until the fall and then put it in the ground. And you really don't need um, any special preparation. You just wanna dig a hole and plant the tree at the same level that it was growing in the pot. And uh, the roots, um, I have two kinds of roots. One is M111, which is a British um, rootstock. And that's the one I used on all the trees. And it's a very vigorous grower. It doesn't need any kind of babying. Thanks so much. I really appreciate this. I'm looking forward to doing something like this with my grandson. Whoops. And we have trees coming for um, Long Meadow Days. Even though Long Meadow Days is canceled this year, we're going to have to try to find a way to distribute 300 trees. So stay tuned. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lindsay, for putting this together. Um, I'm wondering if there's any, you know, further reading. Maybe I missed that part in the beginning. Um, I'd love to learn more. Um, well, you know, there's a very good book on grafting, which I got through Interlibrary Loan. Um, if you're interested in that, I could, um, I could send you uh, the reference. Um, I eventually bought the copy because I kept checking it out of the library and decided it was time to buy it. Um, and online reading, there's a lot of good material on, but the best source for information about antique apples is orangepippin.com. They have uh, descriptions of a lot of different varieties. And um, there, there are antique apple collections in Massachusetts. There used to be one at... Um, the, um, well, I know there's one at Sturbridge Village and there used to be one at the um, Long Meadow, or sorry, the uh, Massachusetts Horticultural Society um, facility just east of Worcester. I'm blo blocking on it, Tower Hill. Uh, they had a great apple collection and uh, I'm not sure if they still have it. I thought that they were maybe moving it, so uh, it, it may not be available. But as far as online reading, uh, there's, there's a lot out there. Um, and, you know, uh, there are a lot of good books available uh, through the library about antique apples. Okay, thank you. And I have a quick question. Um, I'm going to really show my ignorance to do with plants. But um, my daughter had mentioned something about that you, you have to have two apple trees. But are these um, sprouts that we're getting from you, they will already be pollinated or whatever? I, could you explain about that? Yes, some apples are, most apples are self-sterile. So they need pollen from another apple tree. But the good news is that there are enough apples and crab apples in town that the bees will find pollen and bring it to the tree. So um, it never hurts to have two apple trees in your yard, but crab apples make great pollinators for apple trees. And in fact, some orchards will plant crab apples to assist with pollination. And so um, it never hurts to have two varieties, but I don't think it's really necessary. You'll, you'll get fruit uh, so, because there's enough apples around. So when you get, you said two varieties. So if I got two of the different varieties, when they pollinate, they keep having their own fruit because you said that had nothing to do with, yeah. That's correct. Yeah, the pollen only affects the seed. The apple itself is entirely dictated by what the scion is. And when you say there are enough trees around, uh, she lives in West Hampton, up on the side of Cub Hill. Oh. Is that still true? <laughs> or does she need uh, two, two trees, as she told me? West Hampton, I, I would think that there would be plenty of apple trees around there. You only oh, need- Oh, yes, I'm just thinking, yes, just down the road is a uh, is Outlook Farm, or yeah. Outlook Farm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, the bees, the bees go for miles. Yeah, this is, I think they're only two miles away. So mm -hmm. that's good to go? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. One tree, fabulous. Yep, one tree should do it. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we had one more, well, at least another question from Celeste. I'll unmute her. So 
Um, I live in an area where there are no trees, zero. The developer came in and took every tree out and he doesn't like trees. He's anti-tree. Hmm. Uh, would, would, would I be successful in planting one? Also, it's because there are no trees here, it's very, very windy. Mm. Well, actually, apples benefit from a little airflow and full sunlight. So I wouldn't hesitate to plant an apple tree in a windy spot. And it's very likely that there's an apple close enough to uh, pollinate it. Okay. If not, you can always buy um, a crab apple. They have them sometimes for $10 at uh, the big box stores. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. If you were going to buy two of those varieties that you have on offer, what would you suggest to get? Oh, I love them all. Um, <laughs> Ashmead Kernel is my favorite. Um, and Westfield, seek no further. You can't do better than that. It's got such a great name. And like I said, it was one of the three most popular apples in colonial times. Great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So I, I think that might be it. I wanted to say thank you so much to our tree warden, Dave Marinelli. This was so special. Um, thank you for being so flexible and helping us get this on Zoom. We really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me and I can't give a talk unless I have an audience. So thank you to the audience. <laughs> and anyone interested in a tree, if you can please contact me um, via email. Um, L-G-I-L-L -L at longmeadow.org and we can get you all set with that.